Hello, I'm Marianne Deveni. Although the Asia-Pacific region has recovered from its lows of 2008-2009, valuations are still attractive. That's according to Andrew Graham, portfolio manager of the TD Asian Growth Fund and head of Asia at Martin Curry. Well, welcome, Andrew. Good to Thank have you Thank you, Marianne. Nice to be back. Way from Scotland. Yep. Nice to see you. So what are you seeing that makes these valuations attractive? Uh, when you when you look across at everything else out yeah, there. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, your earlier comments are absolutely right. There's been this uh, tremendous re-rating mm -hmm. of um, equities globally, but Asia really hasn't participated in that. And so if you look at the mar market multiples today, like the PE ratio on Asia today is about 13 times. Mm. Now you compare and contrast that with uh, the US market, which is on about 18 times. Europe's on about 16 and a half times. So, it, you, know, it, it, you know, optically it's much yeah. cheaper than the, than, than the rest of the world. And there have been some good reasons for that. You know, return on equity has declined a little bit in Asia in the last few years, but is now showing signs of stabilization. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we're starting to see an improving relative earnings performance out of Asia. So it's just interesting that Asia has continued to grow mm -hmm. over the last few years, but that hasn't been reflected in valuations. So you think it will play catch up and... and well, it could well do. I mean, yeah. obviously it's, 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 it's hard to forecast market outcomes mm -hmm. um, with any degree of accuracy, but... You know, it's interesting to me that you have this, this sort of quite meaningful valuation discount at a time when, you know, so the, if you think about the, the, the world index trades at about 16 and a half times earnings, Asia's on 13 times. The return on equity in Asia is broadly the same as really? the return on equity, uh, uh, if, you know, for the world stock market. Mm -hmm. um, but you've got this relative improvement in performance on earnings. So, I mean, not, not a lot of people realize in seven of the last eight months, earnings revisions in Asia have outperformed the rest of the world. Wow. And yet there's been no real reaction in markets yet. So it's an intriguing juncture. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there any specific places like in Asia? Like I know China is always a huge focus for uh, investors uh, when they hear things. Is, is that the place to be? No, it, it's, it's more broadly based than that, to be honest. I mean, obviously, on one hand, we've seen important political change in India, which, will, will, which is ushering in a period of quite meaningful structural reform in that country, which will, again, will support longer term growth. Um, China is coming from a place where growth rate has been decelerating for the last few years, really since 2010. Uh, and the, the rate of decline seems to be moderating right now. Mm -hmm. uh, valuations in China are obviously quite attractive, but there's more to Asia than just China. And you, you have other really powerful dynamics, the growth in intra-Asian trade, um, the growth in consumption across the region. So these are all quite important things, and they're not endemic to just one country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So where would you look then if you're looking for stocks? Obviously, you're, you're going across the region, but where would you find pockets that are interesting? Any, any interesting stocks you're seeing out there? Sure. Well, we, we, we have a very much a bottom-up approach to investing, as you know. And so our, we tend not to think, well, this country looks interesting. Let's go and find companies there. Mm -hmm. It usually comes from the other way. A lot of companies are appearing to be attractively valued. Oh, that's interesting. Why? Yeah. And then we, then we go and do the analysis. And, and today... Uh, you know, we, we see, you know, again, across countries and sectors, quite a lot of opportunity. Um, we, we're less excited about places like Australia, where the growth is decelerating, the economy is really slowing down. Um, whereas we're actually overweight in China right mm. now. Uh, and that is through some exposure to domestic consumption in China, but also we have been very underweight Chinese financials. We've started to narrow that a little bit because there are some signs of positive change there. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, uh, we, we had made an awful lot of money in India last year. We've taken a little bit of money off the table there, mm -hmm. but we've put some more money to work even in Korea recently. So uh, there's lo lots of opportunities. Yeah. Now at the stock level, uh, you asked about mm -hmm. that. Well, some of our long-term holdings, we continue to really find, offer a great deal for investors, you know, with companies like AIA, uh, that's a pan-Asian insurance company, life insurance company, but even Samsung Electronics, which has gone through a tough time over the last year, but they're starting, their product cycle starting to swing back their way again. So we see an improving earnings performance coming from Samsung, but even 
um, you know, some smaller companies. We, we've invested in a company called BFG, which is a, a retailing company in Korea. It operates a chain of convenience stores. Uh, and that's a company where it's seeing an improving um, in business performance, mainly been driven by some operational changes that they brought about. The, the underlying consumption environment in Korea is reasonably benign, but it's more operational change, which is dri driving improving returns there. So, you know, that's just a few examples, but mm -hmm. there's, there are many, many more. Many examples, I'm sure there are. Um, is it difficult then for an individual investor looking to get into some of these stocks? I mean, obviously the large ones are perhaps easier to find in ADA. But uh, what about the smaller ones? Is, is it pretty difficult to get in? Yeah, one, once you step away from the very largest of companies, mm -hmm. actually the ability to access them directly um, is, is quite tough and you really need to go through a vehicle of some sort, whether it's um, a fund like mm -hmm. the, the fund we're discussing today or, or some other vehicle. Uh, because there aren't really that many companies that have ADR. I mean, there's only 17 or 18 Indian ADRs, for example. Mm, so, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, so you really have to you go through a, a vehicle like this to, to access the broader range of opportunities in the region. All right. Well, I guess that narrows your uh, your options anyway. Less to look at. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that if you're able to invest with people who, who've been covering the region for a long mm -hmm. time and understand a lot of the pitfalls in the region, uh, and can also, uh, you know, devote time to looking in some some areas that are maybe less well trodden by investors. Then, then mm -hmm. you, you you know that that by investing with us, you get that 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 opportunity. All right. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. I've been joined by Andrew Graham, who's portfolio manager of the TD Asian Growth Fund. Thanks for watching.